Good morning, church. Wasn't well, that wonderful? Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What does that even mean, praise the Lord? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we want to praise your name. Be with us as we open your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 What picture comes to your mind when you hear that phrase, praise the Lord? Does it come um, clapping maybe? Um, raising hands? Um, we're entering the time of year where a lot of people will be coming to church due to the Thanksgiving season, the Christmas season, and the New Year season. And there will be many Thanksgiving services, Christmas services, or New Year services. And people will be going to churches because it's that time of year where you have to go to church to praise the Lord and give thanks to the Lord. But what does it mean to praise the Lord? What actually does the Bible say it means to praise the Lord? Praise services seem to be a new thing now um, in, in Christian churches. And in some churches, it's a time of the worship that gets the most attention. Of praise songs, praise team, praise leaders, and maybe there's even a sermon somewhere in there. And it's become so popular to, um, to get your praise on. And, uh, and let, let the music and the rhythm uh, start and you might, you know, get emotional and the name of Jesus may get repeated over and over that sounds like a chant. And it turns more into an emotional event. And when I hear or see these types of praise services, worship services, it reminds me of Matthew chapter 18. I invite you to, to turn there. To Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 15, I'm sorry. 15. If you're following the bulletin, is yes, Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, verse 8. Here, these are the words of Jesus. And he says, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips. But what is far from him? Their hearts is far from me and in vain they worship me. So what does it mean to, to praise the Lord? To give glory to God? Praise his name. We're going to look at two points. And I'll tell you right up front what they are. That praising God is one of them declaring what he has done. We're going to see that the Bible tells us that praising God is declaring what he has done and praising God is following the will of God. Amen. So turn with me to Psalms, our scripture readings, 107. Psalms 107, verse 1. Psalms chapter 107. In verse 1 through 3. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemer of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered out of the land from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Here, the psalmist David is telling us, oh, give thanks to the Lord. And in the Hebrew, this is an imperative. For those that are familiar with English grammar, imperative is a command. He's not suggesting, oh, I suggest you should give thanks. No, he's saying, you must give thanks. The Ten Commandments are an imperative when, when, when you see it there in the, in the Hebrew grammar. If you were to read this in the Septuagint, 
which is a translation of the Hebrew to the Greek, it actually says, Hallelujah to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord. But David tells us why. Because he is good. God is good. No matter what happens, no matter what people say, no matter what you may think, the Bible says, God is good. For his mercy endures forever. He is good. David is telling us that we should praise God because of who he is and because of his character. We are to praise God also for what he has done. As his character calls us to praise, so also his behavior calls us to praise. We are to praise him for who he is and for what he has done. If you see there in verse 1, for his mercy endures forever, let the redeemer of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed. What has he done for you? Redeemed you. He has redeemed us from the hand of the enemy. Praising God is declaring who he is and declaring what he has done for you. What he has done for you. That is what biblical praise is. What isn't biblical praise? Just saying praise the Lord isn't biblical praise. Praise the Lord. For what? Praise him for what? Everything. Everything. For, waking me, for waking me up this morning. For bringing me here safely. For keeping the car running smoothly as I got here. Nothing blew up. Praise the Lord. Is declaring what God has done for you. Praising just saying praising God is not praising God. It's the, it's, we can say it's the prologue to praising God. You begin by saying praise the Lord and then you begin to actually praise the Lord by declaring what he has done. You see, there is a false praise that is focused more on self, on seeking my own rather than seeking to declare what God has done. It shifts the focus on the almighty me instead of the almighty God. It's a praise that its goal is how it makes me feel and it's all about me. But here according to Psalms 107, praise is all about God, declaring what he has done. There are other examples if you turn to me to Psalms 103. Psalms 103 verses 1 through 5. We're, we're going to cover just a few, but the Bible is littered with praise and declaring what God has done. Psalms 103, 1 through 5. Bless the Lord, all my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, all my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Here comes the praising who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Praise the Lord. Here David is praising God and then he's actually praising him. He heals you. He feeds you. He forgives you. He is declaring what God has done. He is declaring what God has done. Do we have something to declare what God has done in your life? Yes. Amen. Absolutely, yes. Psalms 107. 107, but this time verse 22. 107, verse 22. Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. It's not just sacrificing, but also declaring his works with rejoicing. How about Isaiah chapter 25? 
Isaiah chapter 25. Verse 1. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. Why? For you have done wonderful things. Your counsels of all are faithfulness and truth. You want to praise God? Then declare what he has done for you. Declare what he has done for you. There are many other places. There are some scriptures that are in the bulletin. I'm not going to cover here. But when, when Jesus was born, the angels came to Bethlehem and they're in Luke and declared the Messiah has come. What are, the, what are they praising God? What has he done? He's come to rescue humanity. He's come to die for you and me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That is what biblical praise is. Praise and thanks de declaring cannot be separated. Praising God and declaring what he has done cannot be separated. Everywhere you see it in the Bible, it's together. It's together. So if somebody says, I just want to praise the Lord, and they say quiet, invite them. Well, then praise him. Declare what he has done for you. Declare what he has done for you. We cannot come to church with unthankful hearts and think that our great singing or great instrument playing can impress God. God has the best in heaven. <laughs> the best singers, the best musicians in heaven. But he is still wanting a thankful heart, a thanksgiving heart that declares what he has done for you and me. Our best performances don't move God. Our thankful hearts and declaring to others is what God is looking for. If you turn to Matthew chapter 7, we'll see also what praise is. As we are entering into this season of thanksgiving and, and praising God, and, church, and people will be coming to churches to thank God and to praise God. Matthew chapter 7 gets now a little bit personal. Verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who praises my name will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who opens the hymn and says, Lord, Lord, or the Bible shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Amen. Could Jesus be suggesting, suggesting that there is a hollow praise? Jesus here is linking praise with obedience. Praise with obedience. Not everyone who opens their hymn books or their Bibles or claims to be praising God is praising God if there is a heart issue. If the will of God is not being fulfilled and you know what the will of God is. Amen. Praise God that the Bible says that he winks in our times of ignorance. When we don't know, God doesn't hold us accountable. But when we do know, he says, he expects repentance and to follow what is good, what is right, Amen. what is right. Obedience begins in the heart. It begins in the heart. That's why, as we read in Matthew 15, these people are drawn near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are not following my will. Their hearts are far from me, and in vain they worship me. When praise and thanksgiving begin, God starts looking at the heart. God starts looking at the heart. And that would suggest that there are some things or some stuff that we may be enjoying that God isn't enjoying. Because he's looking at the heart, not just the outward expression. And we may be singing and raising our hands and are clapping and praising God, but he may look at us 
And maybe we were somewhere Friday night where we shouldn't have been, and we know better, and God just says, I don't think so. I don't think so. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me. What comes out of the mouth is a natural response of what is in the heart. If, we, if, if, if our lives are, are a life of obedience, a life of thanksgiving, it is a natural response to praise God. This is why real praise can still happen even if you've been diagnosed with cancer. Even if you are going through a hard, hard trial, real praise can happen. Because praise and thanks have nothing to do with your condition, but with your relationship with Christ. Amen. Turn with me to the book of Job, chapter 1. I want us to see Job's response. Did, did Job go through, through hard trials? Job lost all of his sons. He had 10 sons in one day. One day. All of your children are lost in one day. I just think about just losing one of my child, and I have three, just one. Some of you have lost your children, and you know what that experience is like what that trial is like, or you have lost a spouse. Here, Job is gets the news that all of his sons are dead. Not just his sons, his property, his possession, his health. He loses it all. And in a quick moment, not in a lifespan like most of us. And in Job chapter 1, verse 21, he says... Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord takes away. And then he says, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Verse 22 says, In all this Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. Why didn't he charge God with wrong? Because he read Psalms 107. Well, it wasn't written yet, but Psalms 107, he knew that God is good. He didn't understand, but he did not blame God because he had a relationship with him and knew that God is good. Even in chapter 2, after he loses his health and his wife tells him, in verse 9, chapter 2, verse 9, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. <clears throat> verse 10, But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept ad adversity? What is Job saying there? <laughs> we can't just accept only the good things. If God lets something bad happen, we should what? Accept it. That's exactly what Job is saying. And this isn't a little bad thing, like, like you get a flat tire, you know, you lose your keys. He lost his health, his friends, and his children, and many of all of his possessions. And he is saying, we can't just accept the good things. We've got to accept the bad things that come in life too. And it, can, and it says again, in all this, Job did not sin with his lips because his heart was in the right place. His heart was in the right place. There is someone that I want to share with you to turn to the book of Ezekiel chapter 28. There is someone, though, who did praise their God with their mouth, but their heart was in the wrong place. Ezekiel right before Daniel, chapter 28. I'm talking about Lucifer. He was made perfect. There in verse 12 through 17, 
It says, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, <clears throat> the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. This was Lucifer. Now we can get our, our presentation ready, our PowerPoint. I want to share with you, okay, this is Lucifer. Was he made perfect? He was made perfect. I want to share with you uh, two quotes of Lucifer's role in heaven. <clears throat> and I want, us, I want us to read together. That's why I put them up here. I could just read it from my notes. But I want us to read, there it is, from Story of Redemption, page 25, okay? Let's read. The hour for joyful, happy song of praise to God and his dear son had come. Satan had led the heavenly choir. He had raised the first note. Then all the angelic hosts had united with him and glorious strains of music had resounded through the heaven in honor of God and his dear son. Satan was the praise leader. If anyone knew how to praise God or was a trainer to praise God, Satan was it. He was the one that raised the first note. You know how, how people, whenever they sing a cappella, they always hit you know, a note, boom, and they kind of tune themselves. Satan tuned everybody. Here we go. Um, whatever it was. <laughs> and Satan could sing harmony at the same time. Perfect, created, as we read here. It was per he was made perfect. It says here that, uh, where did I read that? You were made perfect in your ways. So Satan led the music. Let's continue from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 36. The angels joyfully acknowledged the supremacy of Christ and prostrating themselves before him, poured out their love and adoration. Lucifer bowed with them, but in his heart there was a strange, fierce conflict. Lucifer was among the singing, among the praising, and even bowed with them. And even bowed with them. All right, let's continue. You too, balcony. The influence of the holy angels seemed for a time to carry him with them. Stop, stop. What did the influence of the holy angels do? Carry, carry him, See. Satan, See. him with them. Now let's, 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 let's go on. As songs of praise ascended in melodies, strains, swelled by thousands of glad voices, the spirit of evil seemed vanished. Do you see what godly music does? You want to always maintain a, 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 a holy spirit, a holy attitude, a spirit where evil is vanished? Just listen to good Christian music. Keep a hymn in your heart. Keep a song in your heart. It's hard for the devil to, to always be tempting us or to us to fall into temptation if we're always keeping a joyful hymn, song, praise words in our thoughts and in our voices. But notice, Satan, for a little time, while he sang and directed the choir, Evil seemed to vanish just a little bit while he was singing. While he was singing. It continues. 
unutterable love thrilled his entire being. His soul went out in harmony with the sinless worshipers in love to the Father and the Son. But again he was filled with the pride in his own glory. His desire for supremacy returned and envy of Christ was once more indulged. Wow. His soul went out in harmony with the sinless worshipers in love, he, in love to the Father and the Son. But what happened? When the praise was over, when the singing was done, he went back to where he had started. To where he went back to iniquity in his heart again. Thank you. That's all the quotes that I'm going to share use because his life was no longer praise he goes right back to where he was he felt good while he was singing but as soon as it was done he went back to criticizing God he went back to criticizing the authority of Jesus so that's why friends the devil says you want to come to church Get your praise on, get it on all you want. But if your heart isn't in the right place, when you come home, I'll be waiting for you right there. We cannot let ourselves come to church and get caught up in the singing and service. Only. If our praise is not backed up by praise lives, we are just playing church. Anyone can do that, friends. The devil did it. He sang, bowed, but when the singing was over, he went back undermining the character of God. His heart was not following the will of God. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of the Father. And in that same verse later on, it tells us, <clears throat> even though they cast out demons in their name and did many wonders in the name, Jesus will declare to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. That's why God is going to take to heaven only those that he has a relationship with. Amen. Only those who he has a relationship with. These people draw near to me with their hearts and honor me with their lips, but their hearts and, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So what does this mean for us, church? In Isaiah, Isaiah chapter one, I'll tell you, the Bible will tell us exactly what it means to us. Join me to, in the book of Isaiah, chapter one. Verse 13. Here, God is tired of vain worship. Tired of it. Vain sacrifices. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 13. Bring no more futile sacrifices. He doesn't just say sacrifices. What kind of sacrifices? Futile sacrifices. Futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniqui iniquity and the, and the sacred meeting. You see what's together? Iniquity and sacred meetings. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. I am weary of bearing them. Here God is tired of just religiousness. Stop bringing your religious feasts and festivals and your, and your futile sacrifices that aren't changing your heart, mean nothing to you. If they mean nothing to you, they mean nothing to me. And the pews in some churches are filled with people whose hearts are in the world. 
And we can't come to church and try to, to, to buy God with our pretty singing and our pretty playing or our pretty dressing. Friends, who cares what we do in worship if the worshipers are not connected with Christ? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how conservative we are if we are not connected with him. Our conservativeness doesn't impress God. Now don't misunderstand me. I am a conservative Christian. But if my heart isn't connected with him, it doesn't impress him. It means nothing. It means nothing. Here, Isaiah, God is telling the people through Isaiah, stop bringing your sacrifices that you don't mean, keeping my feast that you don't mean. They stink. I hate them. Verse 15. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. The most dangerous thing about religion is religion. The most dangerous thing about religion is religion. Because it gives us a sense of security. A sense that I'm in the church. My name is in the church book. And some people get all worked up if somebody's going to get removed as if that removes you from the kingdom. What removes you from the kingdom is your name written out of the book of life. Amen. Not in the book in the church. And we come to church and just, you know, let's just think, you talk to your friends, how did you, you know, what did you do today? I went to church. And in your mind, you just check it off the list. God will not take religious people, singers, musicians who claim to praise God if their hearts have not been changed, friends. It's all a matter of the heart. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Giving praise to God. Jumping up and down. Amen. Friends, if there's nothing in the heart, you can jump to your blue in the face. <laughs> and God will just look at that. I don't think so. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord. So then what should we do? Praise the Lord. The answer is in verse 16, Isaiah chapter 1. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doing from before my eyes. Cleanse. I'm sorry, cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. See, God is reasonable. Come, right now. Let's think about this. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Praising God is declaring, as we've seen, what he has done. Praise the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. For the church that is planted and been growing here in Cleburne. Praise the Lord for his faithful people that he has in this church. Amen. Praise the Lord for those that are doing outreach and seeking the lost. Praise the Lord for our Christian education that we have here and, pro and provide for, so our young people can have a Christian education. Praise the Lord for our Hope Clinic that gives medical attention to those who can't afford it. 
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord and then declare why you want to praise the Lord. But praising the Lord also involves, as we've seen, doing the will of God. Doing the will of God. The sermon title is Thanks Living. God is wanting a thanks living more than a thanksgiving. A life of thankfulness. Living thankfully. And when you live thankfully, you declare His goodness. You do His will by His strength. By His strength. I can do all things. I can follow all the will of God by Christ who strengthens me. By Christ who strengthened me. God wants a thanksgiving, not just a thanksgiving, not just a thanksgiving. God wants a life of praise, not just a moment of praise. So I just appeal to you, church, here from verse 16 and onward, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor. Come now. Though your sins were like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Do you notice at the beginning when I started reading, God says, stop it with your silly sacrifices. I don't like it. But yet, he always, always says, come, I will forgive you. I will forgive you. Cleanse, follow the right way. Though your sins are red, I will make them as white as snow. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat of the good of the land. It's not just this top part that we look at and say, wow, God is so mean. But yet God is wanting true praise, true worship, which comes from obeying, from following his will in the heart, in the heart. So I just appeal to you, church, today, that your life may declare his goodness and may reflect his will every day of your life. Amen. That your life may declare the goodness of God and may reflect his will in your everyday life. Is, is that your desire, friends? Yes. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to praise you because you are good and merciful to us. As we've read, your love and your mercy endures forever. Thank you for being merciful to me, a sinner. And thank you for being merciful to us, sinners. We want to come with a true praise, a true worship, and help us to align our hearts with you. That everything that we may do or say may be in according to your will. And as we declare your goodness, we praise you. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.